Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration is a single verse from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, chapter 3, verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So far the word of our God. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, who has achieved the justification for all of mankind through his perfect life, through his innocent death on the cross, and whose resurrection is the assurance that that justification is now yours, dear fellow redeemed. 500 years ago, minus two weeks and two days, a young monk named Martin Luther made his way to the church door at Wittenberg with 95 theses in one hand, a hammer and a nail, a set of nails in the other. And through this action, which has become to be known as the hammer blows heard round the world, Martin Luther set off what is now known as the Reformation. It was not unusual for people to post announcements and things on the church door. It was kind of like the town bulletin board. Martin Luther wrote these 95 Theses in Latin, and in so doing, he was inviting the scholars and the biblical theologians of his day to come and, ch and challenge him on these theses that he was writing. Now this was very early in Martin Luther's uh, theological career, and many of the 95 Theses we would certainly would not agree with or have, any, have anything to do with today. But one in particular I'd like to read for you is Theses number 6 of his 95 that he wrote. I think it fits our sermon theme well today of justification. He says this, The Pope cannot forgive any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been forgiven by God. I'll read that again. The Pope cannot forgive any guilt except by declaring and showing that it had been forgiven by God. You see, Dr. Martin Luther recognized a very important truth that many, many others of his time did not. And that is that God and God alone is the only one who decides who has guilt and who is righteous in his eyes. That God and God alone is the one who worked out the plan of salvation. And no man, no pastor, no priest, no church can declare you righteous, but God and God alone. Today our focus is on the doctrine of justification, a teaching which truly stands front and center of all of the teachings of the church. Because justification is the very heart of the gospel itself. Now there are a few passages we can think of from scripture that encapsulate the entire message of the gospel in one, in one verse. Perhaps the most famous of them all, I like to call the gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That verse outlines God's rescue plan, his mission for Jesus Christ, how he's going to rescue the world from their sins. But there's a lot of words in the Bible that encapsulate the gospel entirely as well, and justification certainly is one of them. This word justify is a forensic term. It's a term from the courts, and it means to declare righteous, to declare innocent, to pardon, to acquit, to forgive. When you hear the word justification, I like to teach my confirmation kids. When you hear the word justification, you should think, just as if I never sinned. That's how God sees us. Justification makes it so when God looks at you, it's just as if you never sinned. It brings to mind that eternal courtroom of divine justice of our God. With God sitting in the, in the judge's chair, and you, the sinner brought to the bar of justice, cannot help but plead guilty. The prosecutor, Satan himself, brings before God Almighty a list of all the wrongs that you have done. Of every time you did what you should not have done, and every time you didn't do what you should have done. All these listed out. All the sins that you thought you'd hidden your entire life are listed before God, and you cannot help but plead guilty. But then comes his honor. Christ as attorney for the defense. And he pleads for you, the condemned sinner. He offers his own merit. He offers his own suffering on the cross. His death as atonement for the sins of the guilty one. And God, the judge of all flesh, looks down upon you. 
carefully examines all the evidence presented by the prosecutor and by your attorney, and he declares you righteous for Christ's sake. This is the judicial action before this word, justification. Think of God banging his holy gavel and declaring you righteous. As you start reading Paul's letter to the Romans, we're in the third chapter here, chapter 3. But in the first chapter, he begins by really condemning the entire world. He starts with the Gentiles, those non-Jews, and he says, The Gentiles have been worshipping not the Creator, but the creation. They've been worshipping silver and gold and wood and idols. They've been worshipping material wealth. And as punishment, the Lord permitted them to become victims of their own lusts, he says. You can read the last part of chapter 1 and, and see what God thinks about those ancient Greek and Roman philosophers who tend to be held up on a pedestal in our world today. And then God turns to the Jews, who had the advantage of the law and the prophets. They had the Old Testament before them. And yet, despite this advantage, the Jews also stand be condemned before God. Because they cannot keep the law as they agreed to, all the way back on Mount Sinai, when Moses first gave that law. And so the Spirit, through the pen of Paul, condemns Gentiles, condemns the Jews, condemns us all. And Paul expressed that judgment in the words of the psalmist. He quoted Psalm 14. He says, They have all turned aside. They have all together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. You and I have to include ourselves in that verdict as well, don't we? And if we think that perhaps we are the exception, we read from 1 John, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. The guilt of all, without a single exception, made necessary God's plan for justification of all mankind. And we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all are ju that are just, we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's another one of those gospel words, redemption. The idea to buy back, to pay the ransom. You can think of prisoners of war. A purchase price needs to be made to bring them back from the enemy back to bring them back home. Or you can think of slaves. A price needs to be paid to purchase a slave. We were slaves, weren't we? Slaves to sin. We were prisoners of war. In the war between God and Satan, we were Satan's prisoners. We were his slaves and we were his followers. And a price needed to be paid to set us free. And what was that price? We can read from Martin Luther's catechism that the price could not be silver or gold. In fact, Peter tells his readers, Know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So many people today think money can buy them happiness. If I just acquire enough material wealth, then I can truly be happy. And yet, we see again and again in the world that the more one gets the more one needs the great rat race to acquire the most thing, the most stuff. But the purchase price of sin could not be material wealth. Not all the money in the world, not all the wealth of the wealthiest man on earth could pay the purchase price of a single sin. It had to be the blood of God and God alone. For thousands of years, the Old Testament Jews sacrificed the blood of beasts on the altar to God as a picture of the bl that blood, that death, is the price for sin. We read that later on in Romans, that the wages of sin is death, death and death alone. John says the same thing. He says, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's kind of a difficult word, isn't it? Propitiation. Other translations go with the word expiation, but I don't know what that means either. The word actually means, and it brought to mind to the, peop the people of the, the Jews, the idea of the mercy seat. It means satisfactory payment. And they would think of the pla that place, the Holy of Holies, where once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest and him alone could go into the Holy of Holies and before God sprinkle on the mercy seat the blood of the Lamb. And on that same solemn day, they would put all the sins of all the people on a scapegoat and cast that goat out into the wilderness and leave him alone. And these two yearly events were really a picture of Christ, wasn't it? That was why they went through this. Because Christ had to 
shed his blood on the offering seat of God. Christ had to take all the sins of the entire world and be shunned, not just by the Jews, not just by you and I, but be shunned by God himself, forsaken by God, on the cross. And why? For the sins of the people, for you and I. Let us make sure what we are under talking about today, today is the very heart of the gospel itself. Lots of people know the details, know what happened to Jesus. They've seen the movies about what happened to Christ. They've read about it. But few understand the true reason why Christ went to the cross. Paul puts it very simply. He says he was delivered for our offenses. Jesus had no sin. Despite the efforts of the high priests, of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they followed Jesus around for three years during his ministry. They tried to find something that he would say wrong. They tried to trick him and trip him up in some way, but they could find nothing wrong with him. In fact, his judges, Pilate and Herod, both had to conclude, I can find no fault with this man. And yet those judges pronounced him guilty. He was condemned to death. And why? Because he was, because he is, the sin bearer. The burden of all the sin and guilt of all mankind was loaded on Christ's shoulders. Can you imagine a time in your life? Can you remember back to a time in your life when you felt that guilt in the pit of your stomach, where you had done something wrong. Maybe as a little child, you get caught with your hand in a cookie jar, and you really feel that guilt on your in your stomach. And then as you get older, and the sins seem to get worse, not in God's eyes, but get worse in terms of consequences, and that guilt, guilty feeling. Now imagine every time in your entire life when you felt that guilty feeling, and pile it all on at once. That would be nearly unbearable, wouldn't it? And now imagine Christ who we read in 1 Corinthians, became sin for us. He took all the sin, all the guilt of all people of all time and poured it on himself, allowed it to be placed on his shoulders. Imagine that guilty feeling that he had for all the sin of all people of all time. Can't imagine what he went through for us. And he carried that burden to the cross, that sin, the guilt, and there he declared, it is finished. He had paid the penalty the price that needed to be paid for you and I. He died for the assurance that our sins are gone. And when Jesus cried out, it is finished, was he correct? Was he right? Was it over? The answer came three days later at his resurrection when God rose, raised Jesus from the dead. If Christ had failed, God could not have raised Christ. But because he did, we can be assured that our Lord Jesus was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And what are you and I to do now? We have this verdict of justification for ourselves. Well, what did God do? On that Easter morning, through the earthquake that rolled aside that stone, he proclaimed to the world that I accept the price that was paid by Jesus Christ. Through the angels speaking to the women at the tomb that morning, they said, He is not here. He is risen. That proclamation of justification for all mankind is for you and me to continue to share. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commissioned his disciples again and again, telling them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You will be witness to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. This message of justification is yours and mine to share with others. But as we look around in this world, on every side, all we can see is sin and the effects of sin. The newspapers, the magazines, the internet, the television, you can't go to any of them without seeing the sins of man upon man. The courts of our land have files and computers full of everything that all the people of the world have done wrong. The consciences of each one of us, unless it has been dulled by sin, continues to condemn us. The guilt remains, that pity your stomach feeling guilt and God gave us that guilt for a purpose, so that we remember that we are sinners, and that we have a Savior. That guilt is what drove Martin Luther nearly to the point of insanity. He would flog himself until he'd pass out from pain. He would starve himself to the point of being unhealthy. It nearly drove him to suicide. Some people take that guilt and cast it aside and say, 
lie to themselves, really, like we talked about in 1 John. They say, I have no sin, or at least I'm not as bad as these other people. God must like me better than these others. Look how many times I've gone to church in my life. Look how many times I've given an offering in the offering plate. Others imagine that God is love, so he has to love me. He has to take away my guilt. He will overlook it. But God did not overlook guilt. God did not sweep it under the rug. God did not hide your guilt in the closet. God dealt with your guilt. He gave it to Jesus, and he took it to the cross. That is the message that helps you and I. In the sin-sick, guilt-stricken world that we live in, that is the one and only cure. Remember that thesis I read at the beginning of our sermon? The Pope cannot forgive any sin. The Pope cannot forgive any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been forgiven by God. At the beginning of our service, we confessed our sins, and I'm sure many, many times you have come to this church and say, I confess my sins of thought, word, and deed. And the pastor says, I, as a called servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you. Whose grace? Not the pastor's grace, not the church's grace, but God's grace announced to you. Christ, God, is the only one who can forgive sins. You know, there's a lot of things on earth, it seems like everything here on earth has a price tag, but there's only one exception. Forgiveness is free. Removal of all guilt is free. Victory over death and life eternal are free. There's no strings attached in this offer. There's no fine print at the bottom of the page you have to read. There's no announcer rattling off all the side effects of whatever medicine you're taking at the end of the commercial, speaking way too fast for anyone to hear. Forgiveness, pardon, justification, righteousness, life eternal are yours, and it is free. It can't be purchased by man. It cannot be merited or earned by you. But rather, it is a free gift of God. The gospel is not a lifeless word, but it is, as it says, it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And while this message sounds forth, the Spirit of God works in the hearts of you and I, works in believers, the faith that believes this promise, the gift of forgiveness from our God. And so through faith, you and I can say, even though I'm a sinner living in a sinful world, I live under the grace of God, who has forgiven all my sins for Jesus' sake. And even though I'm a dying individual in a dying world, in me lives the faith that will lead to life eternal. And though Satan accuse me, he cannot condemn me, because my defender is Christ Jesus. And we can say with Martin Luther, I am justified by faith. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <coughs>